This short video shows how RSF1 can be used to create a highly available ZFS storage appliance. A wide variety of ZFS system topologies are supported. Let's look at a simple configuration of two separate servers. RSF1 is installed on both servers and cluster communication is initiated by a number of heartbeat connections. RSF1 heartbeats are packets containing cluster-wide status information, not just pings. Network heartbeats use TCP IP. Serial heartbeats use low-level RS232C protocol and are not dependent on an IP stack. The disk heartbeat uses a single block of disk outside of ZFS, which means no storage device is wasted. To ensure cluster communications are up to date, only one heartbeat connection needs to be maintained, meaning that all must fail before RSF1 detects a system failure. Networking fault monitoring allows alternative routes to be automatically enabled. With RSF1 running on both nodes and cluster health maintained through operational heartbeats, services can now be configured. Let's assume for this example that we have three ZFS pools and an Apache web application which we want to run associated with pool B. We'll also configure some VIPs to provide access to the storage and applications. We'll configure server 1 to primarily run and provide file and block access to pool A and pool C. And server 2 will primarily run pool B and Apache. Each RSF1 service can be an automatic or manual failover mode. RSF1 configuration is performed on one node and then automatically distributed to all other nodes in the cluster. Let's see how this works when the RSF1 clusters have been configured and the servers are first booted up. By default, all services are set to manual mode after initial configuration. The operator can switch these to automatic. As each server boots up and RSF1 is started, RSF1 will initiate contact with any other server configured in the cluster configuration. Let's assume server 1 starts up a few moments before server 2. It is now time for server 1 to start both pool A and pool C. Whilst these services are starting up on server 1, server 2 has booted up. The service countdown on server 1 is aborted and Server 2 will instead start the Pool B service. Server 2 now imports Pool B and starts Apache. At this stage, both servers are running normally with their respective primary services and are constantly monitoring each other's heartbeats. Let's now take a typical example of a system failure. Let's assume Server 2 crashes due to a physical memory failure. Server 1 loses contact with Server 2 across all heartbeats. Server 2 has failed and Server 1 begins the failover sequence. Server 1 forcibly breaks Server 2's lock on Pool B and places its own. Server 1 is now running all three services with minimum disruption and downtime. Server 2 can be repaired and restarted and will rejoin the cluster with all services continuing to run on Server 1. Pool B can be manually moved back to Server 2 at an appropriate time. Now, by way of another typical failure example, let's show what happens if Server 1 freezes and then continues to run a few moments later. As no heartbeats have been received, Server 2 initiates the failover sequences. But while Server 2 is starting the fail services, Server 1 comes back alive and sends and receives heartbeats. The disk ring fencing mechanism protects the service pools and causes the reawakened server to panic. Services continue to run on server 2 and server 1 restarts and remains in standby mode. Again, services can be manually moved back at a convenient time. Applications can also be managed by the RSF1 high availability framework. Let's assume in this example that the Apache processes have failed and, for whatever reason, attempts to restart on the same server also fail. Once the Apache service has been manually repaired on server 2, 
the service can be returned to automatic mode. These examples show how high availability can be achieved using RSF1 for both storage and applications across two servers. Let's now extend this example by showing how RSF1 can be used beyond a single data center, which is by nature a single point of failure, to a stretched cluster topology. Let's assume we have another facility, a disaster recovery site, in a distant data center with both private WAN and independent internet connectivity. In the second site, we have Server 3 with its own storage, which can communicate with Server 1 and Server 2 via a private WAN connection. Between sites, however, there is a single point of failure, the WAN connection. And so we must add further resilience by using external cloud-based heartbeats using RSF1 relay agents. Now, let's assume Server 1 fails and see what happens. Server 2 has been configured as the preferred standby server, and initiates failover. All services are now running on Server 2. Now let's assume that we experience total network outage at the primary site. Server 3 detects the failures and is still in contact with the external RSF1 relay stations. Server 2 also detects the failures but cannot see the external RSF1 relay stations and so automatically stops all running services. But in this example, we have configured Pool C not to fail over to the remote site. As the service failover countdowns expire, Server 3 starts Pool A and Apache. Now both critical services are running on Server 3 at the DR site. When connectivity at the primary site is restored, all servers rejoin the cluster and the failed Pool C service is now restarted. Let's now assume that Server 1 has been repaired and restarted. Again, the operator can manually restore service to the primary site at a convenient time. All services are now again running normally, with minimal downtime and disruption. This is a brief overview of the power and flexibility of how RSF1 manages high availability of ZFS storage pools and applications for a wide variety of use cases.